Lesson 10 The Way, the Truth, and the Life Sabbath Afternoon November 30 He who came to our world to seek and to save that which was lost has pledged his own life for man. He has pity and compassion and love that are without a parallel, and he has made every provision in behalf of men that none need perish. The divine Son of God came into our world, its light and life, to encompass the whole world and to attract and unite to himself every human being who is under Satan's discipline and rule. He invites them, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Matthew chapter 11 verses 28 and 29. Thus he unites with himself by a new inspiration of grace all who will come unto him. He puts upon them his seal, his sign of obedience and loyalty to his holy Sabbath. The Upward Look, page 285. This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. These words are an eye-opener to all who will see. The knowledge of God is a knowledge which will not need to be left behind when our probation closes, a knowledge which is of the most lasting benefit to the world and to us individually. Why then should we put the word of God in the background when it is wisdom unto salvation? Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. The Bible is full of the knowledge of God and is competent to educate the student for usefulness in this life and for the eternal life. Become interested in the scriptures. Read and study them diligently. In them ye think ye have eternal life, Christ said, and they are they which testify of me. It means everything to us to have an experimental and individual knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ, whom he hath sent. For this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Fundamentals of Christian Education, pages 403 and 404. Look at Jesus, the majesty of heaven. What do you behold in his life history? His divinity clothed with humanity, a whole life of continual humility, the doing of one act of condescension after another, a line of continual descent from the heavenly courts to a world seared and marred with the curse, and in a world unworthy of his presence, descending lower and still lower, taking the form of a servant, to be despised and rejected of men, obliged to flee from place to place to save his life, and at last betrayed, rejected, crucified. Lose no time. Let not another day pass into eternity, but just as you are, whatever your weakness, your unworthiness, delay not to come to him now. That I may know him, page 56. Sunday, December 1. I have given you an example. Christ gave his disciples to understand that the washing of their feet did not cleanse away their sin, but that the cleansing of their heart was tested in this humble service. If the heart was cleansed, this act was all that was essential to reveal the fact. He had washed the feet of Judas, but he said, Ye are not all clean. Judas brought a traitor's heart to this scene, and Christ revealed to all that he knew him to be the betrayer of his Lord, and that the washing of his feet was not an ordinance to cleanse the soul from its moral defilement. And we have in his example the lesson that the ordinance of feet washing is not to be deferred because there are some professed believers who are not cleansed from their sins. Christ knew the heart of Judas, yet he washed his feet. Infinite love could do no more to bring Judas to repentance and save him from taking this fatal step. It was the last act of love that Jesus could evidence in behalf of Judas. Infinite love could not compel Judas to repent, confess his sin, and be saved. Every opportunity was granted him. Nothing was left undone that could be done to save him from the snare of Satan. The Review and Herald, June 14, 1898, paragraphs 7 and 10.
The ordinance of feet washing is an ordinance of service. This is the lesson the Lord would have all learn and practice. When this ordinance is rightly celebrated, the children of God are brought into holy relationship with each other to help and bless each other. That his people might not be misled by the selfishness which dwells in the natural heart and which strengthens by self-serving, Christ himself set us an example of humility. He would not leave this great subject in man's charge. Of so much consequence did he regard it that he himself, one equal with God, washed the feet of his disciples. John chapter 13 verses 13 to 17 quoted. Ellen G. White comments in the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 5, page 1138. When Jesus girded himself with a towel to wash the dust from the disciples' feet, he desired by that very act to wash the alienation, jealousy, and pride from their hearts. This was of far more consequence than the washing of their dusty feet. With the spirit they then had, not one of them was prepared for communion with Christ. Until brought into a state of humility and love, they were not prepared to partake of the Paschal Supper, or to share in the memorial service which Christ was about to institute. Their hearts must be cleansed. Pride and self-seeking create dissension and hatred, but all this Jesus washed away in washing their feet. A change of feeling was brought about. Looking upon them, Jesus could say, Ye are clean. Now there was union of heart love for one another. They had become humble and teachable. Except Judas, each was ready to concede to another the highest place. Now with subdued and grateful hearts, they could receive Christ's words. The Desire of Ages, page 646. Monday, December 2. I will certainly come again. Little children, Christ said, yet a little while I am with you. Ye shall seek me, and as I said unto the Jews, whither I go, ye cannot come, so now I say to you. The disciples could not rejoice when they heard this. Fear fell upon them. They pressed close about the Savior. Dark were the forebodings that filled their hearts. But the Savior's words to them were full of hope. He knew that they were to be assailed by the enemy, and that Satan's craft is most successful against those who are depressed by difficulties. Therefore he pointed them away from the things which are seen to the things which are not seen. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18. From earthly exile he turned their thoughts to the heavenly home. Let not your heart be troubled, he said. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also, and whither I go ye know, and the way ye know. The object of Christ's departure was the opposite of what the disciples feared. It did not mean a final separation. He was going to prepare a place for them, that he might come again and receive them unto himself. While he was building mansions for them, they were to build characters after the divine similitude. The Desire of Ages, pages 662 and 663. Peter kept alive in his heart the hope of Christ's return, and he assured the church of the certain fulfillment of the Savior's promise, If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. John chapter 14, verse 3. To the tried and faithful ones the coming might seem long delayed, but the apostle assured them, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The Acts of the Apostles, page 536. In the contemplation of Christ, we linger on the shore of a love that is measureless. We endeavor to tell of this love, and language fails us. We consider his life on earth, his sacrifice for us, his work in heaven as our advocate, and the mansions he is preparing for those who love him. And we can only exclaim, Oh, the height and depth of the love of Christ! Herein is love, not that we loved God, 
but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. 1 John chapter 4, verse 10 and chapter 3, verse 1. The Acts of the Apostles, pages 333 and 334. Tuesday, December 3. I am the way, the truth, and the life. The disciples were perplexed. Thomas, always troubled by doubts, said, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also, and from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. There are not many ways to heaven. Each one may not choose his own way. Christ says, I am the way. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Since the first gospel sermon was preached, when in Eden it was declared that the seed of the woman should bruise the serpent's head, Christ had been uplifted as the way, the truth, and the life. He was the way when Adam lived, when Abel presented to God the blood of the slain lamb, representing the blood of the Redeemer. Christ was the way by which patriarchs and prophets were saved. He is the way by which alone we can have access to God. The Desire of Ages, page 663. Lord, show us the Father, said Philip, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, Show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? John chapter 14, verses 1 to 10. The disciples did not yet understand Christ's words concerning his relation to God. Much of his teaching was still dark to them. Christ desired them to have a clearer, more distinct knowledge of God. When, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was poured out on the disciples, they understood more fully the truths that Christ had spoken in parables. Much of the teaching that had been a mystery to them was made clear. But not even then did the disciples receive the complete fulfillment of Christ's promise. They received all the knowledge of God that they could bear, but the complete fulfillment of the promise that Christ would show them plainly of the Father was yet to come. Thus it is today. Our knowledge of God is partial and imperfect. When the conflict is ended and the man Christ Jesus acknowledges before the Father his faithful workers, who in a world of sin have borne true witness for him, they will understand clearly what now are mysteries to them. The Ministry of Healing, page 420. When Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, he uttered a truth of wonderful significance. The transgression of man had separated earth from heaven and finite man from the infinite God. Jesus bridged this gulf and made a way for man to come to God. The Review and Herald, November 11, 1890, Paragraph 5 Wednesday, December 4 I am the truth. Truth in Christ and through Christ is measureless. The student of Scripture looks, as it were, into a fountain that deepens and broadens as he gazes into its depths. Not in this life shall we comprehend the mystery of God's love in giving His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. The work of our Redeemer on this earth is and ever will be a subject that will put to the stretch our highest imagination. Man may tax every mental power in the endeavor to fathom this mystery, but his mind will become faint and weary. The most diligent searcher will see before him a boundless, shoreless sea. Christ's Object Lessons, page 128 We are living in a time when Satan is working with all his power to discourage and defeat those who are laboring in God's service. But we must not fail nor be discouraged. We must exercise greater faith in God. We must trust His living Word. Unless we have a firmer hold from above, 
we shall never be able to cope with the powers of darkness that will be seen and felt in every department of the work. Earth cisterns will often be empty, its pools become dry, but in Christ there is a living spring from which we may continually draw. However much we draw and give to others, an abundance will remain. There is no danger of exhausting the supply, for Christ is the inexhaustible wellspring of truth. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 7, page 276 When Adam's sin plunged the race into hopeless misery, God might have cut himself loose from fallen beings. He might have treated them as sinners deserved to be treated. He might have commanded the angels of heaven to pour out upon our world the vials of his wrath. He might have removed this dark blot from his universe. But he did not do this. Instead of banishing them from his presence, he came still nearer to the fallen race. He gave his son to become bone of our bone and flesh of our flesh. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. John chapter 1 verse 14. Christ, by his human relationship to men, drew them close to God. He clothed his divine nature with the garb of humanity and demonstrated before the heavenly universe, before the unfallen worlds, how much God loves the children of men. The gift of God to man is beyond all computation. Nothing was withheld. God would not permit it to be said that he could have done more or revealed to humanity a greater measure of love. In the gift of Christ, he gave all heaven. God's Amazing Grace, page 53. Thursday, December 5. The Scriptures and the Truth. In the Word, the Savior is revealed in all his beauty and loveliness. Every soul will find comfort and consolation in the Bible, which is full of promises concerning what God will do for the one who comes into right relation to him. Especially will the sick be comforted by hearing the word. For in giving the scriptures God has given to mankind a leaf from the tree of life, which is for the healing of the nations. How can anyone who reads the scriptures or who has heard them read lose his interest in heavenly things and find pleasure in amusements and enchantments of the world? Ellen G. White comments in the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 5, page 1134. The Word of God includes the scriptures of the Old Testament as well as of the New. One is not complete without the other. Christ declared that the truths of the Old Testament are as valuable as those of the New. Christ was as much man's Redeemer in the beginning of the world as he is today. Of Christ's life and death and intercession which prophets had foretold, the apostles were to go forth as witnesses. Christ in his humiliation, in his purity and holiness, in his matchless love, was to be their theme. And in order to preach the gospel in its fullness, they must present the Savior not only as revealed in his life and teachings, but as foretold by the prophets of the Old Testament and as symbolized by the sacrificial service. In every age there is a new development of truth, a message of God to the people of that generation. The old truths are all essential. New truth is not independent of the old, but an unfolding of it. It is only as the old truths are understood that we can comprehend the new. When Christ desired to open to his disciples the truth of his resurrection, he began at Moses and all the prophets and expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Luke chapter 24 verse 27. But it is the light which shines in the fresh unfolding of truth that glorifies the old. Lift him up, page 306. In preaching to the Thessalonians, Paul appealed to the Old Testament prophecies concerning the Messiah. Christ in his ministry had opened the minds of his disciples to these prophecies, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Luke chapter 24 verse 27. Peter in preaching Christ had produced his evidence from the Old Testament. Stephen had pursued the same course. And Paul also in his ministry appealed to the scriptures foretelling the birth, suffering, death, resurrection, and ascension of Christ. 
By the inspired testimony of Moses and the prophets, he clearly proved the identity of Jesus of Nazareth with the Messiah and showed that from the days of Adam, it was the voice of Christ which had been speaking through patriarchs and prophets. The Acts of the Apostles, page 221. For further reading, The Upward Look, Where's Your Treasure, page 355, and Our High Calling, Almost Home, page 367.